one of the most important discussions of our time, the struggle between privacy and surveillance. Our guests today each bring a unique perspective to that question. Uh, Harry Halpin is CEO and co-founder of the NIM Foundation. Nadine Strawson is a former president of the American Civil Liberties Union and professor of law emeritus at New York Law School. Seven Waterhouse is the CEO of ORCID. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Minda. So just to uh, get us all started, uh, what was the state of the privacy conversation be before COVID-19 and how do you think the crisis has changed it? This is for all of you, but maybe uh, Seven, uh, do you want to start? Yeah, so I think um, something like three years ago when we started ORCID, uh, when we were talking to people um, looking for support, um, there was still a question at that point of, uh, is privacy something people care about? Um, and this was still in the wake of uh, Snowden's revelations about the NSA tracking information and so on. And remember, um, a lot of the stuff that happened uh, as a result of the Patriot Act came after um, another crisis, 9-11. Um, and a lot of this regulation does get rushed in very rapidly. It's almost like it's already pre-prepared. Um, so I think that was we were... Thankfully, at a point where people were becoming a lot more aware of uh, exactly how much information uh, was being used, was being gathered, and potentially being used about them. Um, and I think also there was a, a kind of a growing realization of how um, issues of surveillance and censorship were happening globally um, uh, with big supporters of the Human Rights Foundation and Oslo Freedom Forum, and, and they've been done a great job of really highlighting a lot of those issues. Uh, but then, then then, we have COVID and things are starting to change, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon. It is true that every time that there is a crisis, whether it's a national security crisis or a public health crisis, uh, somehow there's an assumption uh, that if we gave up any of our civil liberties, including privacy and free speech, that that would necessarily promote the countervailing concern. Um, to the contrary, though, if government is unduly engaging in surveillance and data gathering, it is not only going to undermine our privacy, it's actually going to undermine public health. Uh, because if people distrust uh, government surveillance, they're not going to cooperate in even methods that would be privacy protective in terms of um, for example, anonymized aggregated data about uh, where cases have occurred uh, to facilitate contact tracing and so forth. So I think we have public health and privacy actually are really mutually reinforcing here. If we want to build uh, a system for uh, effective contact tracing, we need to have people understand that the government is and private sector uh, parties who are participating in it are really as privacy protective as feasible, consistent with the need to gather the data and protect public health. Yeah. Um, so I, I would like to point out the fact that what we've had, the, the largest difference between the sort of 9-11 era of privacy invasion was that the main excuse we, we have to stop terrorism, that somehow if we monitor every single US citizen, uh, we somehow, somewhat like finding a needle in a haystack, will discover terrorists. Of course, you know, all objective evidence that we have access to says that this was not the case. Um, now we're seeing the same uh, rhetoric be put forward in terms of public health, that it's necessary for public health to basically do massive surveillance, to have some sort of idiotic community passport, perhaps even put it on a blockchain with some ridiculous technology like W3C did. And then and then and then you have an app to go outside. And it is true that you know testing plus contact tracing has worked in other countries. And we've seen, I'm in Europe, we're seeing a transition into mass contact tracing now. And what we've seen is a huge fight, which is very different than 9-11 where essentially you have a decentralized model backed by researchers from universities, primarily uh, NIM advisor Carmela Troncoso and EPFL and many other universities 
who actually built a system which is more decentralized, uh, which actually was adopted by Google and Apple, and they're coming up against resistance mm -hmm. from nation states like France and the UK, which are saying, oh, you're violating our national sovereignty because it's in our best interest to surveil our citizens for public health purposes. And, and how this conflict is painting out in Europe seems to be that people are picking up decentralized solutions, mm -hmm. uh, but that we're not sure, and I'd love to hear from other people on the panel, um, how we expect this struggle around privacy enhanced uh, contact tracing and privacy in general to play out in the United States, which is a very different uh, political terrain. And I think the main difference is that in 9-11, the nation state uh, was viewed as an all powerful entity that, that was fighting these sort of little terrorist groups. And now if you look at Trump, if you look at Boris Johnson, it's clear that the nation state itself is in a period of, I would, I would call it decline and degeneration. It has less trust. Uh, and seemingly less competence, I think, than people even thought it had uh, before the Iraq war. You know, there's one really interesting difference between the uh, privacy grab post 9-11 and what's actually two really significant differences that are positive from a privacy perspective and also from an efficacy perspective, because they go hand in hand. The sweeping surveillance that we still have in place after 9-11, because once it's there, it just never goes away, right? Um, was is as ineffective in actually apprehending and deterring terrorism as it's effective in suppressing privacy. So it's the worst of both worlds. But uh, there are several differences. Number one, uh, the Patriot Act was rushed through with almost no debate and, uh, and, and uh, within something like less than one month after the terrorist attacks. And as was suggested, it really had been on the shelf before. It was the government's wish list of uh, privacy invading powers that they tried to pass after the then prior worst attack uh, in US history, namely the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. And they just had it on the shelf, like, dusted it off and, and rushed it through with no meaningful debate. Uh, secondly, until Snowden's revelations many, many years later, people assumed that they were giving up other people's privacy in order to protect their safety. Uh, they didn't understand that it was universal. Now I think everybody understands we're all in the same boat. So one difference is there is a lot more deliberation now with a lot more input from civil society. And I would say, you know, support that um, spans the international, the global scene uh, in that the same privacy protecting principles that have been really better protected in Europe are also at least paid lip service to in this country, which is, you know, don't rush it through unless you at least make sure that it's effective, that beyond being effective, that it's necessary, that there's no less privacy invading approach that will be as protective uh, of public health. There's got to be a, a, a sunset provision, right? The least intrusive alternative. I think all of those principles have wide support across the ideological spectrum now. Yeah, I think, um, Nadine, your, your comment was um, well made in the sense that uh, I do think that one of the challenges that even the decentralized um, sort of design of Apple and Google and, and uh, inspired by other people's work, as you were suggesting and, and explaining, Harry, um, I think that's actually going to have a lot of resistance in the U.S. I, I'm from England, but I'm on the West Coast in San Francisco, uh, and certainly the a lot of the the kind of bubbles that I move within, I just don't think people will want to download anything, especially from someone like Google if it's backing it. Apple's a little bit more trusted, but um, I think it'd be interesting to see. Uh, I, I'm not optimistic about the adoption of something like this, and it's hard to it's hard to enforce something like this. Um, some governments are suggesting that we, I think the UK was suggesting that at some point people have to download an app and, and use it when they land at the airport. But uh, even enforcing something like that is very challenging. Imagine the, the amount of police force or sort of random checks you need to do on all travelers unless those travelers are a small minority. And these, uh, this virus is so widespread at this point that it, it's... It's unless you have zero cases, it doesn't make that much sense to me to be restricting travel to the extent that we are anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic about contact tracing unless it's done by a draconian force, uh, as been as been happening in, in parts of Asia. Um, no matter how well it's designed. Yeah, if we do a, a cross balancing, 
it's so interesting. All of the analyses that I've read by, you know, tech experts and public health experts uh, say that the pro- certainly location uh, co- data collection and surveillance is absolutely completely useless. And even the Chinese uh, recognized that it was just giving too many false positives. So they apparently gave up on it. Uh, but that even proximity tracing, which is apparently what the Google app and Apple uh, approach are looking for, is also highly flawed because it's not sufficiently granular to get the only relevant information, which is were people in a situation where they were close enough without, and also without other barriers that uh, they could likely transmit the virus to each other. And even for that to be effective, you need to have, um, you know, pervasive using of the apps. And so for all of these reasons, we don't even really get to the question of, um, well, is it worth giving up privacy? Because we're not really getting any public health benefits at this point. Uh, And I say that that's what the experts are saying. Yeah, but I would like, like to point out that there's huge, okay. No, no, no. Go, go ahead, Harry. We actually we have to wrap okay. it up, but I, I'd love to hear your final final thought on this. Thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the danger that we, we face is that effectively, it's not that is contact tracing effective or not. It's not that is surveillance effective enough in defeating the coronavirus. It's that the state will always attempt to maximize the surveillance of its own citizens. Uh, when we're in a state of possible civil unrest or possible dissolution of state power or competition with, mm-hmm. with other nation states. And, and the danger is that if what they're trying to, what I think people, would, the state would like to do in the name of public health would be essentially normalize these regimes of tracking and surveillance even more so than they did after 9-11. And this, is, this would lead to sort of, you know, passports to work, immunity passports, being, I think, effectively, to be honest, as someone who lives in Europe, a kind of new yellow star. And I think this is very dangerous. I think we, this is the kind of machinery that I think COVID-ID will put into place. I think it's going to be very hard to push back. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I've been pretty impressed with the amount of pushback I've seen so far, and hopefully uh, we'll see more in the future. That's a great note to end on. Yeah. It's uh, painful to wrap this. You guys, we could talk about this all night. I think you touched on so many of the themes that we had wanted to get to. This is emblematic of a much larger struggle. Uh, thank you so much again to our guests, Harry Halpin, Nadine Strassen, and Dr. Stephen Waterhouse for being here. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very thank you. much. All-